So good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Brooks Roach, Manager of Patient Knowledge and Connection with Diabetes Canada. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you and begin by acknowledging that I am joining this webinar from traditional and unceded Mi'kmaq territory. Uh, wherever you're joining and watching from, I'd like you to take a moment to express gratitude and consideration uh, for the land on which we live and acknowledge all past inhabitants of these indigenous lands. I would like to issue a very warm welcome today to our guests, uh, Dr. Valeria Rock and Ryan Hui. So Dr. Valeria Rock is an associate professor at the University of Toronto's Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation and director uh, of the program for Health System and Technology Evaluation. Dr. Rock is also co-lead of the Diabetic Retinopathy Screening Research Program for Diabetes Action Canada and was recently awarded a Diabetes Canada Research Grant for her work exploring the use of provincial healthcare data in creating a Canadian Diabetic Retinopathy Screening Program. So welcome, Dr. Rock, it's great to have you. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. It's great to be here. We are also joined by Ryan Hui. So Ryan uh, lives with type one diabetes and experienced sight loss due to diabetic retinopathy. He is the program lead for CNIB's Come to Work program. Ryan's also a passionate advocate for inclusive health supports and a leader in both the diabetes and sight loss communities. So Ryan, great to have you here and thanks for joining. Thank you so much. I think you're giving me too much credit though, but uh, I'm very excited to be here and to, to drive this conversation. And uh, I look forward to all the questions and, and everybody out there. So welcome to everybody. Thanks, Ryan. Um, so again, to, to those who are, are, are tuned in, watching and listening, uh, today we're going to be discussing diabetic retinopathy, sight loss and accessibility. So our two experts here will be addressing some key points on the interconnection of these issues uh, and providing some strategies for people living with or at risk of developing diabetic retinopathy on how to live well and, uh, and potentially prevent, when possible, uh, diabetic retinopathy and sight loss. At any point during the webinar, please feel free to pop your questions uh, as a comment on Facebook, and these will be passed uh, directly to our panelists during a question and answer period at the very end. So without further ado, we'll, we'll dive into some discussion, and, uh, and I'd like to first pose a question to Dr. Rock, which is wondering if you can provide an overview of diabetic retinopathy. So what are its, what are we talking about when we talk about diabetic retinopathy or DR and what are its causes and symptoms and how does it relate to sight loss? Thank you, Ryan, uh, for the question. Uh, so, sorry, um, uh, Brooks. Uh, diabetic retinopathy, I would like to start by saying that diabetic retinopathy is uh, truly a public health issue. It's a serious uh, vision threatening complication of diabetes that is preventable. It potentially impacts around 3 million, over 3 million uh, people, uh, Canadians are living with uh, diabetes. And uh, it does account for approximately 80% of blindness in persons living with diabetes. And it is the leading uh, cause of blindness in working age Canadians. Um, uh, just to, again, give uh, a little bit more info on how uh, important this condition is and discussing it, is that uh, it, it is estimated that by 2021, we have now approximately 650,000 individuals in Canada who live with some form of diabetic retinopathy and approximately around 140,000 with a sev uh, severe sight threatening condition. Um, I would also like to uh, mention that uh, diabetic retinopathy can develop in anyone who has type 1 uh, diabetes or type 2 diabetes. And the longer person lives with diabetes and the less controlled their blood sugar is, uh, it's more likely to develop this eye complication. Uh, it is caused by the damage to blood vessels uh, by sugar. Uh, blood vessels of the light sensitive tissue at the back of the eye called the retina. And then uh, what happens, uh, blood sugar cause the little blood vessels of retina to, uh, to clog basically and to prevent uh, de delivering of the nourishment and blood supply to retina. As an as a attempt to, to kind of compensate that, uh, our eyes try to develop new blood vessels. However, those new blood vessels do not develop properly. They can leak easily 
and uh, as a consequence to that, there is a damage to the retina. Uh, damage can be in the form of swelling, bleeding, scarring, and in the end, even the scar tissue can uh, literally peel off retina as a wallpaper, uh, literally, and cause a full deterioration and loss of eyesight. What's a little, uh, what's really interesting is that the, at the beginning, there may be no symptoms or only very mild vision problems. Some of those symptoms that might be there is like a spots or like a floaters in the eye vision, uh, blurred vision, uh, some dark or empty areas in your vision, and then in, in, it can progress to a full vision loss. Um, if left untreated, diabetic retinopathy uh, can progress across the four different stages. It starts with a milder non-proliferative one where, um, where symptoms, as I mentioned, might be even fully absent. It, over the time, it can progress to more advanced form of diabetic retinopathy, which is also called proliferative diabetic retinopathy, where these new blood vessels are being developed, which are not fully functional. They can break, they are fragile, they can leak, they can uh, really uh, damage the retina and cause uh, more severe symptoms of uh, diabetic retinopathy. So that would be a kind of a, a summary of uh, diabetic retinopathy itself, symptoms, and also how important this condition is uh, for Canadians is living with diabetes. Thank you very much, Dr. Rockin. As, as our uh, audience can likely appreciate from that, that answer, it's, it is a complex and, and very multifaceted condition. Um, and what they may also be wondering, and this is our next question, uh, is diabetic retinopathy, or can it be preventable? And if so, what strategies can people use? You, you referred to self-management of blood glucose and, and time and range, et cetera, but, but what else can, can people explore? Absolutely. So what's very important to uh, appreciate that, that early detection through regular diabetic retinopathy screening is a very effective method of avoiding vision loss because by the regular screening, we are enabling early detection and timely treatment of diabetic retinopathy. It is recommended with, uh, with respect to Canadian guidelines, it is recommended that all people with diabetes receive regular diabetic retinopathy screening, either annually or biannually, depending on the risk and of the results of their previous screening. What is really troublesome that even though we have many optometrists, many ophthalmologists in Canada fully equipped to do, to conduct diabetic retinopathy screening, our screening rates in Canada are still, they still fall remarkably short of the recommended rates. So for example, in Ontario, we have around 30 to 40% of people who are unscreened and who should be screened. And that percent goes even much higher in certain communities. For example, recent immigrants, individuals located in a large cities, but living in the low income community, communities, uh, also um, individuals living in remote communities, in uh, indigenous members of the indigenous communities. So um, healthcare system try to address some of these challenges by really involving multiple modes of the screening, one of them being teleretina, which is more, um, uh, how can I say, uh, more flexible with respect to uh, screening. And then screening can be conducted close to patient homes or people's homes. So uh, as, I, as I started this, early detection through regular diabetic retinopathy screening is a very effective. Uh, that's why it's extremely important for people who are living with diabetes to receive this screening either, either annually or biannually. Screening exam is very simple. It entails basically dilation of the eyes so the doctor can really get a better insight into the blood vessels of the eye and retina itself. Uh, again, very effective uh, and very easy to do. Thank you. And, and you mentioned you know, this, this condition progressing in stages and having having different degrees if if someone is uh you know listening to to what you're sharing and the importance of of uh, screening and prevention if someone is already living with diabetic retinopathy or you know like in in some degree 
um, is it treatable and when what treatments or strategies can you uh, can you suggest? Absolutely. So uh, depending, so for mild or moderate uh, non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, patients may not need any treatment. People may not need any treatment right away. However, it is very important to receive regular screening where the eye doctor will closely monitor the eyes. And then once that, when the treatment is needed, patient can get it immediately. In the meantime, if the, uh, again, it's what is recommended, it's a tighter control and better diabetes management, tighter control of the blood, uh, blood sugar levels. But for more advanced uh, um, uh, diabetic retinopathy, there are different treatment options. So for example, there are injections with anti-VGF, this uh, growth factor that usually stimulate the uh, growth of these new fragile blood vessels. Uh, so. Uh, uh, basically stopping that, uh, stopping the secretion of the VGF factor with the injections that actually uh, stops growth of these new blood vessels and de decrease the uh, blood fluid buildup. There is also laser treatment, which, uh, which uh, actually also acts in a similar way, uh, prevents uh, leaks from abnormal blood vessels, stops the leakage with the laser. Uh, there are corticosteroid options and vitrectomy for more advanced type of uh, 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 diabetic retinopathy. What I want to mention, and which is very important, if the even if the patient gets treatment for diabetic retinopathy, it is still highly recommended that patient that people go through the diabetic retinopathy, uh, re regular re diabetic retinopathy screening, uh, even continuously, uh, because at some point the patient may need additional treatment. So definitely there are treatment options. That's why it's extremely important to uh, do uh, go uh, for the continuous diabetic retinopathy screening, regular screening, and then early detection will give opportunity for different treatment options when they are needed needed and which one of them is needed. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Rock. And, and I think and interesting Brooks, Go ahead, it's Ryan. just Ryan here too. Um, just to, just to add on to that too, uh, myself, I've uh, lost my sight about 10 years ago due to diabetic retinopathy. And even for those uh, that might be diabetic or might even uh, be someone with vision loss and diabetes, it's still important to get those eye tests and those eye exams and those screenings done all every single year, uh, even if you don't think your sight is changing because I've found that over the course of 10 years, lots of things have changed that I didn't notice. So I was lucky enough to have them catch some things there and really prevent some, some even worse things from happening, uh, believe it or not. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ryan. And I think there's a really interesting point there that screening is, it's, is in itself a really powerful form of treatment, you know, where it can, can give you a deeper look at at what's going on and and show trends over time that you may not be picking up on because um, these you know this is happening at a very very tiny scale uh, in in a lot of cases and it may not be these these shocking uh, moments of of a dramatic change in in quality of, of vision etc. Um, we do have a, a quick question from from the audience that's just on the note of uh, value I'd recommended uh, annual or biannual screening biannual, that classic prickly term, are you referring to every two years or every six months? Uh, by, uh, sorry, every two years. So years. basically okay. what happens, patients are screened at the annual basis, depending on the results of the previous screening, and also other risk factors, some patients, then some people may need uh, screening every two years. So there is a certain risk stratification, but I would definitely encourage patient, uh, people living with diabetes to go uh, immediately. If they didn't have a screening, uh, talk to your physician, ask, request screening yourself. Also, I want to point out, if I can, if I may, Brooks, uh, one important thing, not every eye exam is screening for diabetic retinopathy. When we were developing this team grant, we had a patient partner who was going on a regular basis, what he thought on a regular basis for diabetic retinopathy screening. However, it wasn't full diabetic retinopathy screening with the dilation of the pupils with a really good uh, 
closer look inside the eyes to see the blood vessels, to see the retina. And in the end, patient did end up, unfortunately, with diabetic retinopathy, not because he didn't attend like uh, exams, it just was not a comprehensive diabetic retinopathy screening type of exam. Great, great point. So yeah, to our audience, yeah. If you're if you're in question, make sure that what you're what you're attending, you know, because you may be very diligent in attending, make sure that it is actually in fact screening for diabetic retinopathy on a, on a regular annual or biannual every two years basis, depending on on what your healthcare provider says. Um, Brian, you, you spoke a bit to your experience of, you know, over the past 10 years. Um, and I'm wondering if you could share a bit more about your experience more generally living with sight loss and, and any advice or recommendations you could, you could provide to our audience, uh, for people who are living with, or maybe at risk of retinopathy or sight loss. And I guess the, the core question is where have you found successes and what advice would you provide there? Of course, no, my life is, is very, very public uh, in that regard, uh, working for the CNIB and uh, being a volunteer for Diabetes Canada, um, I, I tend to talk a lot about diabetes and a lot about vision loss. Um, I'm 35 years old, I've been type one diabetic since I was seven. Uh, and just 10 years ago, I uh, lost my sight due to diabetic retinopathy. But my journey is a little bit unique. And I know everybody says that, but in terms of you know, screening and things like that. I was getting my, my eye tests done and I was a scholarship athlete playing baseball in the States, but all of the blood vessels, um, just like we heard from the doctor a little bit earlier, all of mine kind of decided to go wacky one night overnight and they crushed my retina. And, and I actually have retinal detachment in both eyes. Uh, they have since been repaired, but they're not really um, helping my eyesight out at all. Uh, so I do have a little bit of light perception, but other than that, it's not too much. Um, it's really changed my life. And I can safely say that without the support from the CNIB, from my friends, from my family members and my loved ones, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, knowing when to ask for help and when to fight those battles of independence is really, really key. I am a father of a two-year-old, a little girl named Abby, and I'm also a guide dog user, a yellow lab who is three, and his name is Joe. He's my first uh, guide dog, so I'm really proud of that moment. And I think successes when it comes to diabetes care is, that there, there's a lot there. Um, and again, I'm not a medical professional, so I can't really you know, give you the medical side of things, but just some tips and tricks on what I do. And there's a lot of new accessible sort of technology that's either on the cusp or they've kind of implemented and it's, it's kind of being pushed out now. For me, the big part was I couldn't see my sugars when I'm using a glucometer. I, can, um, I could test my you know, blood sugar. I could kind of find the blood on my finger you know you you kind of have tips and tricks to learn from there it's sort of a trial and error but once you test how do i know what my sugar is um an eight looks like a six if i'm holding it right up in front of my face but uh now there's the libre there's continuous blood glucose monitors and those all hook to your iphone or to a, an accessible uh, device right so looking at that it reads it out to me so Apple has done a lot of the heavy lifting, implementing voiceover and implementing some other things that are very accessible to, to managing my diabetes. Looking at trends, I can send them to my doctor, I can send them to my endocrinologist. However, you know, I don't, I can't really use the graphs too much. I don't know because it's so visual how, um, how you would actually make that accessible, um, to be honest. Maybe that's something to consider. Um, as you had said before, we're fighting the good fight right now, CNIB, Diabetes Canada, and a few other organizations by trying to get an accessible insulin pump out. Uh, for instance, my pump is about 10 years old and it's not accessible. I don't, I can't even tell you how much battery is left in the battery right now because it's all visual on the screen. There's no app, there's no voice output, uh, even a lot of the notifications sound the same. So I sort of have to know when was the last time I refilled my reservoir? Is it about that time? Because that notification is the same as low battery is the same as, oh, you're, you've been out in the sun too long, your pump's too hot. So you sort of have to kind of really remember things. So my pump can kind of be classified as a very fancy insulin pen because uh, it is continuously giving me the insulin, which is great, but I'm still doing all the calculations in my head uh, and testing with an outside source because it's just not accessible. So we're hoping to kind of 
make some more headway. So if anyone is interested, please feel free to reach out to me and we can kind of get going with that. Um, Brooks, I have a question for you. There's two things here and I tell this story all the time, but when I lost my sight, there are two things you probably do every single day, but what are the two most complicated things you think were for me to relearn how to do? Oh, put me on the spot here, Ryan. Um, I don't want to give you any chance to prepare. <laughs> um, diabetes care. I mean, first and foremost, food preparation. I'm going to take a stab. Trying so to that, try to that's kind measured. of one of them. One of them was measuring foods, but I was thinking in terms of I cannot butter toast. Half of my toast will have 14 inches of peanut butter on it. And the other half will have none, even though I think I did it right. Uh, the other was finding blood on my finger to test my blood sugar or recapping the uh, insulin pen needle. So many times I had poked my fingers and, and poked myself. And uh, it, it's really interesting. I don't know that there's an accessible way to kind of do that. You just sort of got to get on with the grind, right? But I, I, I always laugh now looking back at that because the pump is a real game changer. It's just, we're not quite there yet, right? We're almost there. So uh, I'm just hoping that once one pump company man, uh, manufacturer uh, jumps on board, usually nobody wants to be the first. They always want to be a quick second. So I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to, to get some good things rolling here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing, Ryan. And it's, um, you know, I think within what you're talking about, there's this sort of theme that people often hear, which is a lot of the time it's those behaviors that you've, you've learned that kind of feel second nature that are the hardest to get used to post-diagnosis. And that's generally with, with diabetes, we often hear that, no, it's, it's uh, preparing a meal. And then there's this added element of not only preparing a meal and being able to, to count carbs and, and manage it that way and track what's going on in your body, but also to, to literally do the thing and to, to do it in a, in a measured, calculated way. So yeah, I, I really appreciate you sharing that, Ryan, because it's, again, these, these are smaller moments that people don't often necessarily think of. No, absolutely. And to, to the, uh, the audience out there, you know, uh, I always tell this to all of my clients that I help out. Um, the only silly question is the one that goes unasked. So for as wild as you think your question might be, I've probably been asked something a little bit more wild. So feel free to, to ask away. I'm pretty open and uh, you can't help but laugh at yourself because I do some funny things uh, without my sight that I just wouldn't do if I had my sight. Ryan, I'm wondering, I'm going to follow up on, on your mention of the importance of accessible devices. And, you know, many people in our audience um, take advantage of the, some of the wonderful technologies that are out there, whether that's a, a continuous glucose monitor or insulin pump or, or a pen uh, or, or even medications, which often have to be, you know, there's an element of, of visual tracking going on there. Um, if they were, if they're hearing what you're saying and, it, and this is striking a chord or if this is something folks weren't aware of, uh, where would you steer them? Where could they get involved or make their voice heard? Absolutely. So I think the first thing that you have to point out though too is that there's never going to be a perfect accessible device. Um, there's always going to be some sort of flaw, right? So for instance, with, with the Libre, it's awesome. It, it talks to me, but you have to have a cell phone. Maybe not everybody could afford a, a smartphone, right? Kind of thing. So there's not going to be the one be all end all fix, you know, cookie cutter kind of situation, right? But for now, um, if you're looking to kind of join forces with us, you can reach out to me through, uh, through uh, my email or um, find me on Facebook and we can chat. A lot of people have done that. And we can also uh, go to cnib.ca. And we don't really have a fancy URL yet where it's like slash accessible pumps or anything like that. So uh, you would have to root around a little bit on there, but there is a search box, I believe in the top right corner. If uh, you type in accessible pump campaign, a ton of stuff will come up and there's a ton of contacts. There's uh, what we've done year to date, what we plan to do over the next year and how we've partnered with the National Federation for the Blind in um, America, how we partnered with Diabetes Canada, and how we've had three of the four national pump companies here in North America sign on saying, hey, we will do better. We will try and figure this out and we will kind of get moving on finding some way to make our pump accessible. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Of course. Um, Dr. Rock, is there anything before we open the floor to some of the questions we've received, anything you'd like to add or any final points 
on uh, screening prevention or, or given what Ryan's mentioned on some of the steps that need to be made and are being made on improving accessibility of care. Absolutely. So uh, one thing that I will emphasize again, please, if you are living with diabetes, make sure you have your eyes checked. That's uh, talk to your physician, uh, either your primary care doc. If you have uh, a specialist uh, endocrinologist that you work with, voice your concerns and request uh, eye check, diabetic retinopathy screening check, eye, eye exam. It's simple, it's uh, painless, and uh, it can really, really uh, help you save your vision as, as much as you can. Uh, second point, uh, again, as I mentioned, follow up the guidelines. Guidelines are annual screening. In some cases, if you are at my, mild risk of developing diabetic retinopathy, then you may need to screen your eyes every two years. And I also think just to build upon what Ryan mentioned, I think we, we still have a lot of work to do uh, when it comes to innovative technologies to make uh, to, to, to make uh, life uh, better uh, for people living with diabetes and uh, especially for people experiencing uh, um, vision loss. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping that I will have the opportunity potentially to connect uh, Ryan with one of the, we have incubators, uh, incubator at UHN, which is really uh, um, very forward thinking with respect to developing different technologies for people living with different conditions like heart failure, COPD and diabetes. So as a result, just to give you an example, and it's not necessarily for diabetes, they are developing smart fibers that can measure certain body parameters just by, um, and, and regulating just by, uh, let's say having a vest or having a, a socks. So uh, it might be something also worth, and I will definitely talk to the group who is super creative at Kite uh, to bring you potentially, Ryan, uh, with some of your, uh, to describe some of your challenges that you, you very well, you vocalize it so well uh, from your lived experience and uh, put so, some engineering minds uh, together to potentially create something. I welcome the opportunity. The more, the more people that know, the better, uh, even if it's just to get the word out. But thank you for that connection. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Happy to do that. So thank you, folks. It's, uh, this is really, really exciting to see, you know, the, for the audience, you're witnessing, you know, partnership in action and the importance of, I think, also um, the, the power that can come from sharing a story. So kudos, Ryan, for, for being open and and speaking to the need for this and, and, and Val for being receptive. So exciting things can happen. Um, on that note, to hear a bit more, uh, we do have a couple of questions from, from our audience. So we'll start off. Um, and this one, it may be a bit directed to, to both of you. And it's, it's a question from, from Don, um, who's asking, Don just had a cataract replaced a week ago and it's been extremely painful since. And uh, Don is wondering if this is to be expected. Hey, Don, it's Ryan here. Um, I actually had a cataract done in my right eye uh, two and a half weeks ago. Um, keep on with the eye drops. They tell you to do them for a reason, uh, even though it might be difficult. And uh, it, it, it does get better. Um, again, not a medical professional, but um, the, the first about week is the worst. And then after that, you sort of start to notice uh, some things. Um, and wear your, your eye patch, your eye shield to bed because I'm notorious for waking up and starting to rub my eyes. So I, I know what you're going through and I'm, I'm very sorry you had to, to go through that, but uh, I hope it's not affecting the vision. Um, if, if you do, are you, if you are someone living with vision, um, that would be the concern if it is. Um, but if it's uh, kind of, you know, a little painful, a little sore at this point, um, usually the swelling and everything will go down uh, little by little. It affects everyone. Uh, so differently. And if you're a person with uh, diabetes, uh, you know what, keep those sugars in check because your body's more concerned about getting your sugars back to the normal range than it is about healing a cut or a bruise or a scrape. So um, if you can do that, it'll help. It'll help wondrously for you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, hope, yeah, likewise, hope it, uh, hope you get well soon, Don. And uh, you know, Brian, uh, thanks for sharing that. We, we have a question from Tipo, Tina, and Carolyn, who are wondering about the correlation between A1C uh, and, 
and the rates of increased retinopathy or, or risk of retinopathy. So basically both are wondering, Tina's wondering as a nurse educator, uh, they've seen patients who had good glycemic control uh, and still develop retinopathy. And then Carolyn is wondering if there's an A1C level where it becomes more likely to occur or um, you know, where, where it enters into more quote unquote risky territory. It's uh, thank you for the question. It's uh, it's there is a kind of assumption that if uh, blood sugar levels are in a tighter control, it's less likely to develop. However, I wouldn't necessarily just go by that. I would still recommend again um, annual check for diabetic retinopathy. Uh, people respond differently. We heard even from Ryan how his vision loss was absolutely sudden, uh, even though he uh, he did all the diabetic retinopathy screenings on time. So I would definitely, I wouldn't necessarily say that, um, you know, it is assumption that tighter control of the blood sugar level, it's less likely to develop. But anyway, I would strongly recommend uh, go and check your eyes. Thank you. Um... We have Linda who, who says that uh, Linda lives with diabetic retinopathy as well as macular de degeneration. Um, and the response when Linda shared with uh, the healthcare provider was, what did you expect? You've been type one diabetic for 30 years and did not suggest next steps. So I, I think the question that I might pose to both of you here is, is what advice might you have when concerns or, or difficulties of you know, living with an enormously challenging condition like this? Uh, are minimized by a healthcare provider and, and around advocating for oneself or what can what can a person do then? It's Ryan. That's a, that's a difficult situation. I'm very sorry that uh, that you're going through that. Um, but the first and foremost, and I tell a lot of people this uh, because I do get similar type questions all the time, is that don't be ashamed of your vision loss. Um, it's not your fault. Uh, it's it's you know what it, it unfortunately might just be a fact of life, right? And um, it, it's, it's hard to understand what people are going through, even myself with your, we might have the same eye condition, but what you see is completely different than what I see. And we won't be able to sort of describe that to each other. So I think it's hard to describe to the sighted world that, hey, we're visually impaired, or we might even be you know, blind uh, because they, they, there's just no way to understand it. Uh, and I don't mean to take that away from the sighted world. It's just, it's, it's really hard to understand so you have to really advocate for yourself, um, be, be assertive, but don't be mad. Uh, a lot of people think that advocating means let's get angry and yell and scream and we'll get what we want. And I can tell you from experience, I can tell you from seeing it from others, that's not how you get what you want. You sort of have to tiptoe that line of being assertive, not aggressive kind of thing. And it's, it's very difficult, it's much easier said than done. But if you are looking to, um, to, to talk to someone, I can, I can be that someone and you can feel free to reach out to me anytime and we can sort of put you in, in touch with the CNIB advocacy team and we can see uh, how they can help and, and how I can help because uh, it sounds like we might've been through some of the same things. So I do apologize, but uh, I hope we can, we can find you the right help. And I would just like to add that it's very unfortunate that the healthcare professional responded like that, because every experience, every lived experience is a valid lived experience, and nobody has the right to take that away from, from anyone, any of us. So um, I'm, I'm really, I apologize on, on, for that healthcare professional that was not uh, compassionate that was not something that um, actually sh should support patients whom we care for. So on the, on the other note, I completely agree with Ryan that uh, it, it is working. Uh, basically, you are advocating for yourself. Uh, it's unfortunate that your voice could not be amplified by your healthcare professional because it should have been. Uh, so uh, on another note, I, I would also th in a way recommend that maybe if you have opportunity, look potentially for other 
healthcare professional who may provide that. Uh, it's there is no uh, right or wrong in changing the the provider who does not meet your needs. I think definitely your needs were not met with that comment. Uh, not e your physical needs and your emotional needs. So I think uh, you deserve a, a person definitely who will be a better position to to do that. So also think about that uh, as well if you have the opportunity to look for a, a provider who will definitely amplify your uh, amplify your voice and your concerns and your needs. I totally agree. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rock. And I think hearing that from a professional like yourself can, it, it, it's really helpful to, to hear that. So thanks for saying that. Uh, I have a question from Caitlin Rose, who's saying, They've been living with diabetic retinopathy for four years, and when both eyes bleed and are blurry, they can't see their insulin pump. Now, we also use CGM, and this really does help to be able to ask Siri. So Ryan, to your point about uh, having connectivity with uh, a smartphone to ask, in this case, an iPhone, what's my sugar, um, and letting the pump calculate and administer insulin. So Caitlin Rose is, is just curious about speaking more with Ryan about options that have helped uh, and, and might be looking for some individual advice. So Ryan, any, any quick advice? We, we've also shared your, your contact info with, with Caitlin Rose. Perfect. I was going to say, feel free to uh, toss out my email um, to anybody who asks, uh, not a problem at all. Uh, and I feel uh, not, not to not give you an answer, Caitlin, but that's a much longer discussion probably than we have time for here today. So uh, the sooner you can reach out to me, no rush, take your time. And when you feel comfortable and only share with me what you feel comfortable sharing, but we can definitely take this conversation off offline and uh, we can see if uh, we can sort of look at um, getting you in contact with uh, some, some people that might be able to help with some accessible technology and, and some of the options that are available out there. Um, one final question, and uh, unless folks have, have more, please do feel free to, to ask, but this question is from Randy, who's asking if someone is already suffering uh, with diabetic retinopathy, um, just looking for, for confirmation on, uh, is there a way to reverse it? Is there a way to perhaps, you know, treat it really significantly to, to get reversal? So uh, I, I have to say, um, I'm not an eye doctor. So I would definitely recommend that you talk to your um, uh, ophthalmologist, your eye doctor about that. Um, in many cases, unfortunately, the damage that is done uh, it's irreversible. What's usually may happen is basically what, what we need to do is stop progression of the, of the uh, further progression of diabetic retinopathy. But again, I'm not ophthalmologist, I'm not eye doctor, so I would strongly recommend you talk to your eye doctor about that. Uh, but definitely uh, there, is there are treatments that can stop progression of, of diabetic retinop retinopathy. It's Ryan here too. I'm also not a doctor, but I ask that question every time I see uh, my eye doctor, you know, is, is there something that can reverse what's already been done? And I get the, either the, depending what mood he's in, the not yet, if he's in a good mood or the nope, I'm sorry, unfortunately there's not. So um, as far as, as far as I know, and that's, you know, me being the third party telling you uh, from my eye doctor, that's, that's what he's told me. So, and I trust him. He's done a lot of work on my eyes. Yeah. Um, so that, I hope that helps Randy. Um, Cause it is, it's a very individualized uh, answer that your healthcare provider will be able to answer best. Mm -hmm. um, seeing no more questions, uh, we'll move to, to wrap up. And uh, I just like to sincerely thank our audience for the, the thoughtful and, and, uh, and interesting and helpful questions. Um, as they say, if, you, if you're wondering it, there's, there's likely many more who, who are curious and didn't ask. Um, for those who are looking to learn more and stay up to date on this topic and more, Diabetes Canada is, is here to help. So you can visit our website at diabetes.ca. You can go to our social media at Diabetes Canada. And uh, you can always also call our helpline at 1-800-BANTING or email info at diabetes.ca for any specific questions. And we'll do our best to help you. Um, I'd like to give a, a, a huge thank you to our guests. So Dr. Rock and Ryan, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're nearing the end of our time together, but before we close off, do you have any final remarks for our viewers? 
It's Ryan here. Just wanted to say thanks for the opportunity and thank you for uh, the wonderful audience uh, engagement. That was uh, great. And uh, hopefully we can do this again. Absolutely. I will echo this. And I will also mention that we have quite a few uh, big national studies ongoing. So if people are interested to participate uh, and shape the research that we are doing with respect to diabetic retinopathy, uh, Brooks has my email, I'm uh, my contact information, I'm more than happy to and will be privileged to work with any of you who is interested. So again, thank you for the thoughtful questions and great engagement today. Thanks very much. And as mentioned, there are, there are plenty of opportunities to, to get more involved, whether that's in advocacy around accessible devices. And I know, as, as Ryan mentioned, you can visit cnib.ca. Uh, they can direct you further there, as can we. Um, and if you'd like to get involved in, in research and, and or if you're just curious to see what's going on, uh, we, can, we can steer you that direction as well. So don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I hope this webinar has been helpful for you, uh, anyone in our audience. and. Uh, I want to wish you all the best. So thank you and, and take care. Thank you.